Guild Wars 2 is a game built on three pillars. Player versus player content, player versus environment, and world versus world. Each content pillar has its own unique gameplay and styles, but I always find that Fear of the Unknown kills a game mode, so let me break down to you one of the core ways of playing Guild Wars 2. World vs World Before we go into World vs World, let's open up the tab. World vs World is a bit of different kettle of fish. First, let's see what server we'll be playing for. You can either select your guild which links you to their server or you can go in on the server that you've made your character on. Generally, I'm going to stick for myself on Anvil Rock. What that means is that I will play for Anvil Rock for the entire week. We go head to head with three other servers but they can also be combined, i.e. two servers fighting with each other. And that changes week on week. The way it works is like this. Each two hours is a skirmish. And every skirmish there will be a victor. They'll accumulate points over the skirmish and within the one week that you go head to head with the other two servers, you'll determine a victor. The victor will move up a tier, the second place will stay, and the third place will go down a tier. This means that you'll always play roughly around people that are on your experience level or against servers that are your experience level and helps filter so that weaker servers tend to play against each other more often. And this is where a lot of the fun and content comes in. As you can see, in this case, there are 71 minutes remaining of the current skirmish. In this skirmish, Jade Quarry, the red team, are leading. But this does get reset and recalculated per skirmish. So that means that even if you are losing the overall battle, there could be times of the day where your server is stronger. And that's always a good time to get on. The team that's leading gets the most rewards. The team that's in second place gets the second most rewards. And obviously the team in third place gets the least rewards. And let's have a look at the reward structure. As there are four different reward structures for World vs. World. Actually, before we get into rewards, let's have a look at ranks and abilities. World vs. World is actually fairly unique. As you get masteries and you can select them based on your own gameplay. It's like a reset on the entire game. I.e. you don't have gliding. You don't have a mount or anything when you walk into World vs. World. If you want any of these abilities, you actually need to use the mastery system to get your war claw with your mount or to get your glide in mastery. So you select how you want to build. And this is also unique to each individual character that you play. I.e. every character can have a different setup. You can have one that's more aggressive, one that's working on siege weapons, one that can carry more supplies than the others. And you have a unique gameplay style for each one. So, in order to start, probably one of the best things to do is to get the mount. There is an achievement behind this. I.e. you need to capture certain things like towers and keeps to kind of progress the system. Have a look at this as one of your first things that you do. As not having a mount makes you a big target in World vs. World. Having a mount is obviously a very good way to be about it. But if you don't have a mount, trying to stick in a bigger group will help you. As having a mount creates an aura which allows you to run at the speed of a mount even if you don't have one. Another important mastery to look at is at least one point in gliding as this will allow you to glide within your own territory. Carrying supplies can be fairly good. However, another very important mastery to get is provision master. With four points in it, it automatically picks up all dropped loot from enemies. This is very important as a lot of times in big battles you may die throughout the battle. And therefore, you might not be able to get back to the area and pick up loot. So having four points in Provision Master is very important. Two other masteries that I recommend fairly highly is God Killer and Defense Against Gods. Allowing you to survive against the NPCs or kill them quicker. This can make doing healing and also DPS a lot easier. As you don't want to get overwhelmed with NPCs while you're fighting other players. Now based on your style of play, another couple of good masteries to look at is your Arrow Cart Mastery. As arrow cards do a ton of damage and are very much needed in World vs. World. Catapult Mastery, obviously incredibly useful. And also having a look at Repair Master, i.e. repairing things quicker. This can help you save walls in some clutch situations. Obviously having a look at some of the other ones and getting them can be fairly good. 
Ballista Master, Trebuchet Master, Mortal Master, all of these things. Although I don't think they're as important as especially locking down arrow carts and cannons quite early on. As this is mostly what you'll be using for defense or attack. Now remember when I told you there were four different ways of getting rewards in World vs. World. Let's have a look at some of them now. First of all, your reward track. Reward track is basically a way of getting landscape loot while doing World vs. World. You can skip a lot of even your legendary deeds through doing World vs. World. World vs. World is also a very good source of Mystic Clovers and especially the Gift of Battle, which is probably one of the biggest draws to do in World vs. World. It's also a very good way of getting Season 3 and Season 4 map reward currencies to use. As well, if you go into the Trumpet Armor reward track, it's a way of getting your Precursor Armor for your Legendary Armor. That's right, World vs. World has its own Legendary Armor set and it's fairly good to get. It's probably one of the easier ones to get as it doesn't require tremendous skill like in the PvP and also in the Raiding Armor. Although there is another armor coming out fairly soon in the new expansion, let's have a look at what there is on this one. The World vs. World armor is fairly easy to get, as you basically need to get as much pips as you can in the week to cap your pips, and we'll get into pips in the next reward structure. Now that we've brought up pips, let's have a look and see how they work. If you go to the match overview, you can see your current estimated pips. You get pips based on which team is winning, based on your rank, and there are a few other things, i.e. if you had completed wood in the previous week, you get an extra pip, if you use public or private commanding, and also you can see how it scales better with your rank. Also take note that you do get less pips if you're in last place or in second place. This allows you that every single five minutes on this rolling timer for participation, you get pips into your log as you get pips you will get the reward at the end i.e you can see the reward one so once i've completed this whole section here filled with pips i will get the reward one of four then when i complete it again i'll get two or four and so on and so forth you work your way through wood through bronze through silver through gold and you work your way all the way up to diamond You'll also get, at the end, you'll get quite a decent chunk of rewards. Grandmaster Shards, Mystic Coins, the Mist Warp Packet, as well as Memories of Battle. These are all used for different Legendary Crafting or Ascended Crafting. But the most important is to get and cap Diamond in the week. This is the best way. Once you've capped Diamond for the week, you'll notice that it's the last time you'll get the World vs. World Skirmish Claim Toad tickets. You'll start at wood getting three skirmish claim tickets and eight on your final tick. Then in bronze you'll get five with ten on your final tick and so on and so forth. These tickets are what you use to build your legendary armor. They can be used for other things as well. But to build world vs world legendary armor you need to use these claim tickets. So please notice that you need to be tier three or higher participation to receive pips or get more progression towards your reward track. Obviously, we'll get progression for tiers 1 and 2 towards your reward track, but they're actually tier ups. As you can see here, I'm getting 195 reward track growth per 5 minutes, and then also I'll get my pips every 5 minutes. So the higher the tier which caps at tier 6, the better. The participation obviously counts down from around 10 minutes, and then has a safety after the 10 minute countdown, and if it doesn't kind of, uh, if you don't participate in that time, it will tear down to tier 5, then 4, and so on and so forth. So basically what we want to do is obviously progress the reward track. We also want to get pips to make sure that we are also getting these chests here, which have got your world versus world skirmish claim tickets, and also the rewards in there. So those are two of the systems so far for rewards. The third system is quite simple, just general experience. So as you rank up, you get experience, you go up a level. At the end of every level, you get a chest that will have certain rewards in them. They're not extravagant, but there are a few and a few world versus world items. That is the third way. And the fourth way is actually just killing things. Killing players and NPCs in the game will also drop large amounts of um, satchels and such. 
as well as a lot of them do have a chance to drop ascended items although not a very high chance there is a small chance that drops that some of the drops will drop ascended items especially if you run in a massive zerg you know 20 plus players and you kind of just run through killing other teams and other players chances are you'll end up with an absolute ton of satchels in a very short amount of time also do take note that every single camp keep and stronghold will also have these synthesizers they're a way of basically getting crafting materials while doing world versus world so they're also a way to keep you interested in kind of gathering more materials so what is the draw of world versus world to someone who's not into too much pvp i think there are a few draws obviously the four reward structures i spoke of getting very good materials for participating another reason why is the legendary armor legendary armor is pretty hard to get in player versus player content as it can be quite intimidating and toxic when you're doing ranked mode play pve play versus environment is also quite intimidating for a lot of players as it requires raiding to do whereas world versus world just requires you to cap your pips and do pip per content so if you do the full pips for the week which is 1450 pips you can get legendary armor in a very short amount of time although it is time gated it's still a fairly good way of getting it. Another reason why is World vs. World can be played in multiple different ways. You can run with Zergs in 30-man 30, 30 groups or 50-man groups. Or you can do some roaming. Or you can simply just go around and defend keeps and such. So there's a lot of different ways to play. You can play it as intensely or as passively as you want. And this makes World vs. World quite attractive to players that aren't interested in PvP with a high octane 5 vs. 5 content. Another attraction to World v World is the fact that they have their own daily system which are fairly easy to do. So when participating in World vs World you've got to understand the layout and the way that the map works. Let's talk about how the game has decided who's winning and who's losing. First of all, let's have a look at all the maps. The Eternal Battlegrounds EVG is the main battleground. This is where majority of the fighting will happen. You will switch sides per week, so you'll not be the same color every week. And you'll also switch your component. So in this case, we are teamed up with Jade Quarry for the week as Anne will rock. And next week, we'll team up with someone else. The way it works is generally you'll try and hold about a third of the map. But obviously press in and try to take some of the other keeps of the opposing teams. This will weaken them substantially as they won't be able to teleport in and out. Obviously holding Storm Mist Castle is probably the most important thing you can do. Holding this will give you quite a lot of points as well as an extra teleporter that you can use as long as it's not under attack. You'll always be able to teleport back to your starting place. This allows you to try and maintain control of your own key. Obviously the teleporter only appears at tier 3 and trying to build up your places to tier 3 is important. How do you build up to tier 3? By clicking on the, the camp or the tower you can see what it requires. Like in this case it requires 20 Dolyaks to come in to take this camp from tier 0 to tier 1. Then 40 more to get to tier 2 and 80 to get to tier 3. Every time you tier up a keep or a camp, you can take some additional things to make it stronger. The guild that has claimed the keep castle or camp can select how they want to upgrade the keep. These will allow you to be able to try hold that better and try make it harder to take in the future. Now to determine how many points your team is getting, you have to have a look in your overmatch overview panel at the contested area. This tells you what your team controls and what other teams control. This allows you to determine how many points you have. These tear up over the two hour period of a skirmish to determine who wins the skirmish. So who wins that two hour battle from it. Remember, each individual skirmish isn't necessarily as important as the overall week. But remember, winning skirmishes overall will help you win the overall week so having a look at the map now that's why you can tell in this specific case in eternal battlegrounds our team is controlling a fair amount of the map but to counter attack a lot of times the other teams will hit you in your borderlands so here they've taken a couple of towers and i wouldn't be surprised if they try to take some of the keeps that are unprotected like i can see here that op has been taken recently as tier zero this means that a lot of times larger sizes and multiple commanders are quite important into trying to hold your maps but as a newer player you don't necessarily have to worry about this as much just get into the fights try get used to it and enjoy the actual content itself there are other guilds and people that 
watch over World vs. World and have Discord servers where they basically plan exactly at what time what commanders will take over shifts to try maintain and win. Or to try and purposely lose to try and maintain the current tier that they're on. It's a very interesting game if you really do want to get into the nitty gritties of World vs. World. But for interest's sake, most of the time it's about counterpunch. If you have a smaller team and you can't take another team head on, trying to go into their borderlands and control some of their territories can weaken them, meaning that they actually don't get as many points as they potentially could. And when the shift changes and your team gets stronger, you can potentially take over and win more skirmishes. There's also a very sneaky reason why a lot of players do enjoy doing World vs. World. And that's actually power level and also doing key farming. First of all, by doing World vs. World, you can actually get trade points for a character without having to go into landscape. Remember, Guild Wars 2 is designed in such a way that if you don't want to do PvP, you never have to. If you don't want to do World vs. World, you don't really have to. If you don't want to do PvE, you don't have to. This is another example of that. By doing World vs. World, you can get testimonials of heroics or you get skirmish reward chests where you can select testimonials of heroics from. And these allow you to get trade points and you can select where from. You can select from Path of Fire, Heart of Thorns or from Central Terrier. This allows you to actually get trade points for your new characters. As well, it's a very good way to get resources to power level your characters. Ignore the terrible bag. These Tomes of Knowledge, which give you one level up to level 80 and afterwards give you Spirit Shard, drop like hot candy in World vs. World. In fact, I've only leveled one character completely and the rest I've used from these, from World vs. World. An example of the skirmish chest is this. You can select from here a few different blueprints and things for World vs. World. Canned food, which is level 70 food, so not quite great. You can get unidentified dye, transmutation charges, and this is something I pointed out in my cosmetics guide. Badges of honor, which are a really good way to get into infusions for World vs. World. And then obviously heroics again completely sorry for the terrible bags but when doing dailies and you open the box you'll obviously get a few different world versus world resources but the most important are these potions of world versus world reward what they do is they actually give you reward track progress and this can be quite good to stock these up a lot of times when a new map comes out there might be certain deeds or emotes or things hidden so a few new traps that I want to warn you about going into World vs. World. One, never ever attack a camp while a righteous indignation is on the target protecting the camp. Two, make sure to finish your downs. Not finishing a downed opponent can mean that they can rally. And because of the way supports are built in Guild Wars 2, they can get their health back in an instant. So finishing downs is probably the best way not only to make sure that they can't get back up but to make sure your allies that might fall down while they're down get back up even quicker. 3. Make sure that your tier 6 participation is always active. Don't let it drop down to 5 or below as this just means that you're not going to get as many rewards as you want to be getting. 4. Make sure that you have provision mastered to at least 4 to get the automatic loot pickup. This can be paramount, especially when running in big zergs. Even when you wipe, you still get in all that loot. Because sometimes you might wipe in an enemy keep and you'll never get back there. And if there are 20 or 30 bags lying on the floor and you don't get them, that's just incredible loot you've just lost out on. 5. Make sure that you always take the synthesizers, especially the leather nose. As a lot of these can be quite expensive. So have a look at my evil bag again. Make sure that you stock as many memories of battle as possible. You can buy these out of the auction hall, but they do tend to get fairly expensive. One day you might decide to go for the legendary armor, or you might decide to build Conflux, the legendary ring, and in which case you're going to need an absolute train lot of memories of battle. They're very good to stack up while you're doing content. And six, get yourself a build that is not like your normal landscape build. Mostly for landscapes, strikes, raids and fractals, you want to be as glossy as possible. When World vs. World, you want to look at something like Celestials or Givers, or even if you're a DPS, having a look at something with a bit of toughness as well as power. Although you can go gloss, sometimes there are fairly unique builds that can come up. I do recommend maybe having a look at Meta Battle to find a build that you're happy to play, and don't forget to tweak it to suit your own personality. 
Sometimes they can suggest things which are fairly good, but there are one or two ways that generally a lot of players like to play that's slightly different from a better build. I would also say if you play a class, make sure that you have something that you can roam on, but also something that does fit group content style. So in this case, I can play pretty much a pure celestial DPS case, or I can play a heals tempest and I can switch to full givers. This allows me to play two different styles of tempest within one go. And seven, supplies. Always make sure that you're capped on supplies. Hold as many supplies as you can hold and make sure that if you have extra mastery to get some mastery into holding more supplies. It's very important to do this because you never know when you run into a group that requires supplies. Use supplies for repairing walls, for repairing anything and for building. Building catapults, trebuchets, etc, etc. This can mean the difference between me being ready for when a commander needs me to be able to help them build something quickly. Remembering to run supplies as well. I.e. if you are going to take a tower, like let's for instance sake say we're going to come here and take Ascension Bay. We need to basically go and throw down a catapult here at the first wall to break down the outer wall. Going back, grabbing supplies from either the camp or the tower, running it back here and building to make sure these get built. Now if you place them correctly, obviously you can hit the inner wall as well, but some commanders will probably go into the flank side, put the catapults or such down over here and hit it again, making sure that I go resupply and run in for this. This is basically how a lot of the capturing content works in the game, is making sure that you're always ready with as many supplies as possible. Remember, you don't actually have to carry the catapults with you. The commanders will always have superior or guild catapults on their persons. If you want to, as an individual, you can carry a couple of superior guild or even just normal catapults and mess around with them. But don't throw down anything that's not superior, especially when you're running in a big zerg, as it's just going to confuse and waste supplies. And eight, making sure to use team speak only for team content. Generally, the only time you plash slash t in world versus world is when you're somewhere and you know that your team hasn't spotted something if you see a zerg in the borderlands and you know they don't have eyes on it you can call it out so what you'll do in that case you'll link one of the nearby sites of your interest and say green zerg spotted 30 plus something like this you can use map speak but remember if you're on the borderlands your map speak is going to be very limited compared to a lot of the time the group that might be running in the EVG. So make sure that you do call out Zergs only. Don't do silly stuff in the voice chat. It's most of the time you'll get flamed and possibly reported. For more on this build and others just like it, catch me streaming on Twitch. Stop by any time and hang out. If you found this helpful, please subscribe and share with some friends. It will really help grow the channel.